The Saiyan arc features one of Goku's most difficult challenges in the entire series, fighting Vegeta. The super elite Saiyan prince had so much raw potential that even his lack of belief in training and hard work wasn't enough to give Goku a chance at closing the gap between them. However, a Super Saiyan Goku would make for an entirely different fight and an entirely different story. Today I ask, what if Goku went Super Saiyan in the Saiyan Saga? Let's get into it. Piccolo has just died. The reincarnation of the Demon King proves that he isn't his former self and has changed into a new person. This sacrifice leads to Gohan becoming enraged, attacking Nappa in a blind fury. His power level shoots up to 2800, but that's nowhere near enough to hurt Nappa, who easily deflects the enraged Gohan's Masenko. This drained Gohan so much that he couldn't even run away, and so Nappa closes in on Gohan, crushing the boy to death with his foot. Goku was too late to save Gohan in this version of events. He arrives just in time to see Gohan's life ended. That was the last straw. His eyes search the battlefield, and he sees his fallen comrades all around him, his eyes finally settling on the lifeless body of his son. Rage boils to the surface of Goku's face. The planet itself feels like it's shaking. The scouter on Vegeta's face goes off and is rising at an incredibly rapid rate. It's unprecedented. The scouter blows up after reaching 30,000. Nappa! His power is rising incredibly fast! Make an artificial moon quickly! Vegeta realized that they wouldn't have time to find the actual moon. If this power reading was accurate, he couldn't risk dropping his own power, making an artificial moon himself. So, Nappa quickly makes one, dropping his power notably, but allowing both of them to begin transforming into their Ozaru forms. As they do, Goku is in the middle of his Super Saiyan transformation. He's losing himself in a quiet rage, but before he's consumed entirely, he throws the one Senzu that he has to Krillin. He doesn't say a word when he does, and Krillin understands the gesture. Krillin eats the Senzu and gets back on his feet. Goku nods at Krillin, and Krillin steps back from Goku. The Ozaru form multiplier is a 10 times boost, giving Nappa a power level around 40,000, and Vegeta a staggering power level of 180,000, the second highest power level in the entire Frieza Force. As they finish transforming into the Ozaru form, Goku had finished becoming a Super Saiyan. The two Ozaru are taken aback by Goku's form. Vegeta utters a name, Super Saiyan, as he looks onto Goku with a face of sheer disbelief. Nappa is the first to strike out at Goku, but he completely misses the Super Saiyan. You killed my son. I won't forgive you. The quiet rage of Goku left Nappa frightened. He wanted to run away. He wanted to escape with his life but he was too scared to move. Goku kicked the paralyzed Saiyan in the head, knocking him out in one hit. I get it now. Goku thinks about his tail and the monster that killed Grandpa Gohan. His face of rage turns into sadness as he looks down at the unconscious Nappa. Krillin! Goku shouts to his best friend to cut off Nappa's tail, and luckily, Krillin has the perfect technique to do so. Krillin fires a Kienzan at Nappa's tail, Nappa is back to base form, and Goku flies at Vegeta. Meanwhile, Krillin takes this opportunity to go over to Nappa. After everything you've done to my friends, Nappa begins to try and crawl away. I won't let you go. Krillin readies another Kienzan and uses it to end Nappa once and for all. He has avenged the fallen Z fighters. Meanwhile, Goku is dominating Vegeta. While the Ozaru form did slightly close the gap between them, Vegeta's power level of 180,000 wasn't nearly enough to surpass Goku's power level of 400,000. It didn't help that the Ozaru form had lumbering movements, not necessarily slower in raw movement speed, but the form is just so bulky that it couldn't perform techniques with precision and grace that base form could. Goku was outmaneuvering and overpowering Vegeta. There was no hope for the Saiyan Super Elite to win this fight. Goku kicks Vegeta in the back of the knee, knocking the Saiyan Prince to the ground. 
Vegeta is gasping for breath and vulnerable. Krillin seizes this opportunity to cut off Vegeta's tail with a Kianzan as well. There he lays, battered and defeated. Vegeta was on the ground below the legendary Super Saiyan, Son Goku. Krillin was waiting for Goku to finish Vegeta, but instead he said something completely different. I really don't think you needed to kill the other one. Krillin was in complete shock from what Goku was saying. They were both humiliated. This strange power, this Super Saiyan power showed them that they were born with nothing special. Let's take him with us. As Goku says that, Vegeta loses consciousness. Krillin and Goku take Vegeta to a hospital where Goku could watch over the Saiyan as he recovers. It would take some time for Vegeta to fully heal, and as he does, Krillin comes up with the plan to go to Namek in search of more Dragon Balls in order to resurrect their friends, just like he does in the main timeline. They get Bulma to repair the nameless Namekian spaceship that Mr. Popo tells them about, and events are seeming to go very similarly to how they did in the main timeline. The main difference here being that Goku isn't in the hospital, and Gohan is no longer alive. Setting up the Namekian ship takes five days, ten if you include Bulma also learning the language, just like it did in the main timeline. In those five to ten days, Vegeta wakes up. He's confused as to where he is, and as he's coming to, he sees a blurry figure at the foot of his bed. Where am I? His eyes finally focus, so he says, Kakarot. Goku tells Vegeta that they're in a hospital, and Vegeta should be fully healed in a few months. Vegeta scoffs at the idea that it'll take him months to heal. With the healing tanks, he's used to being healed in a matter of days. Why did you spare me, Kakarot? The thought of being spared made no sense. If Goku truly is the Super Saiyan, then he's supposed to be merciless. The warrior of rage, the Super Saiyan, should spare no enemy. Goku didn't answer the question. He didn't really know why. Something inside him told him to spare Vegeta. Maybe he didn't want to be the Saiyan that Raditz said he was. Or maybe he wanted to fight Vegeta again one day. The answer isn't clear, but it's too late to change that choice. Fine, Kakarot. Keep your reasons hidden. But it's good you spared me. You'll need me to help you get rid of the real threat. Vegeta explains to Goku who Frieza is, and the history of Frieza and the Saiyans. He even reveals that he has suspicions that Frieza is the one who killed the Saiyans. Being used by that tyrant for so many years has killed Vegeta on the inside. He lived and died on his pride, and instead, he lived in shame. They need to form a plan to fight Frieza, or else they'll never learn peace, and Vegeta can never regain his pride. All of this was a lot to take in. Goku had to tell the others what was going on and get them ready for the upcoming battle. He asked King Kai what Frieza was doing currently, and to King Kai's horror, Frieza was getting ready to invade planet Namek. The evil tyrant had heard of the Dragon Balls through the scouters of Vegeta and Nappa, so he was making his way to hunt for the Dragon Balls as well. Worlds are converging in a hunt for the Dragon Balls on Namek. Even though Kami's ship is ready, they can't go to Namek so soon. They need Vegeta, and King Kai tells them that even Goku as a Super Saiyan won't be enough to beat Frieza. Dr. Brief was currently working on a new ship, one that could get to Namek even faster, and contained a gravity manipulator. It takes about a month for the ship to be completed, but according to King Kai, they have time to spare. He's keeping track of Frieza's movements to make sure they don't miss their chance. King Kai didn't want to have Goku face Frieza, but with the power of a Super Saiyan and with some training along the way, Goku might just be able to pull this off. As the ship is completed, so too are new Senzu grown. Master Karin gives Goku a bag of Senzu, and he decides to visit Vegeta one more time. He gives Vegeta a Senzu instantly. Vegeta realizes he's fully healed and gets up. So is it time for us to face Frieza? Goku nods and tells Vegeta they'll be training for the entire journey to Namek. Training being something that Vegeta wasn't used to doing. Together, they'd get stronger than Goku training in the gravity alone. 
and he'd try not to use Super Saiyan while training to make sure he gained maximum benefit from it. If Goku turned Super Saiyan, a hundred times gravity would be nothing to him, and thus provide no benefit. But if he remained in his base form, a hundred times gravity was a wall to overcome, just like it was in the main timeline. The two prepare their six-day journey to Namek and set off. The battle against the Saiyans was a victory for the denizens of Earth, but that victory came at a cost. Yamcha, Chiaotzu, Ten Shinhan, Piccolo, and Gohan are dead, and so the hunt for the Dragon Balls will take Goku to a brand new world, the former home of the nameless Namekian who would one day become God and the Demon King of Planet Earth. This is the journey to Planet Namek. After deciding to wait for the improved spaceship made by Dr. Brief and for Vegeta to be healed from his injuries battling Goku, the two Saiyans began a six-day long journey to the world that would provide Goku his wishes and Vegeta his vengeance. Each day, they ramped up the gravity, quickly growing stronger as they did and getting even more powerful than Goku had on his training journey in the original version of events. Before we dive any deeper into that though, make sure you like and subscribe if you want to see more Dragon Ball content. Back to the story though, in the back of Vegeta's mind, he had hoped he could secure a wish for himself, but Goku already expressed that the wish would be made to revive his friends. At this point, they weren't aware of more than one wish, but that wouldn't really matter for Vegeta's case anyway. Meanwhile, on planet Namek, the Frieza Force's scouters have all been destroyed by Elder Mori, just as happened originally, and because Frieza has no reason to fear anything being amiss on planet Namek, he doesn't call the Ginyu Force to bring the new scouters. Instead, Frieza has regular foot soldiers bring him his new scouters. This puts the hunt for the Dragon Balls almost entirely on hold, as it did in the original version of events as well. And the new scouters only arrive a few hours, if only an hour, before Goku and Vegeta arrive on Namek themselves. This means that Frieza doesn't collect all seven Dragon Balls and leaves that collection opportunity open for Goku and Vegeta. When they arrive on planet Namek, the two Saiyans fly around with their key suppressed, looking to collect the final Dragon Ball that has eluded Frieza since he only just recently got his new scouters. This journey takes Goku and Vegeta to Grand Elder Guru in an isolated house that remains hidden from Frieza's forces. When they reach the Grand Elder, he can see that their intentions are pure and decides to unlock their dormant potential to help them retrieve the Dragon Balls from Frieza, though after doing so, he does have some doubts regarding Vegeta. The Grand Elder also orders Nail to go with them so he may help in the battle and speak their wishes to Purunga. With the final Dragon Ball in their possession and newfound power unlocked and unafraid of scouters or being detected at all, the two Saiyans race towards Frieza's ship with Nail following closely. As they all fly there, Goku can see the destroyed villages under them, and the piles of bodies within those villages. Frieza was a monster, probably beyond redemption, but in his head, he thought there was a chance to save him. Vegeta noticed that Goku was looking upset, and he told him to keep focused. Frieza is their target now. When they arrive at the ship, Goku, Vegeta, and Nail easily take care of all of Frieza's fodder. Eventually, Kui, Zarbon, and Dodoria step forward, but each is handled with ease, leaving Frieza no choice but to face them down on his own. Goku can tell right away that Nail wasn't strong enough for this fight, and tells him to go get the other Dragon Balls and summon the dragon. Vegeta turns back and tells Goku to go with Nail as well. He'll take care of Frieza on his own. Goku looks to Frieza with a hint of regret in his eyes, but this is what has to happen. There's no way that Frieza is like Vegeta or Piccolo. He's a monster beyond redemption. So, Nail and Goku go off to collect the other Dragon Balls, and as they do, Frieza aims a death beam at them. But Vegeta blitzes Frieza and grabs his hand. Your fight is with me! As Frieza and Vegeta begin to fight, it becomes very clear that Vegeta's base form is far surpassing Frieza's first form. As Vegeta gloats about his own power, Frieza says that he has transformations that would wipe the floor with Vegeta easily. Vegeta simply laughs at Frieza and says he has a transformation of his own. As he says this, the sky turns dark and instantly Frieza's mind jumps to the Ozaru form of the Saiyans. How could he time this fight so perfectly with a full moon? Frieza, however, quickly remembers that Namek has no night, and more importantly, no moon. Even if it did, Vegeta has no tail to take advantage of the Ozaru form, 
So what could he mean? Go ahead, Frieza. Transform and show me your true power. But you might want to go all out right now. I won't give you another chance. So Frieza begins to transform into his final form, but he still refuses to use his full power since it drains far too much stamina and his final form on its own should be more than enough to suffice. As Frieza begins to transform, Goku becomes unsettled by the rapid increase in energy he's feeling and is hoping that Vegeta can handle it. But he can't focus on that right now. He can help Vegeta after the wishes are granted. Once Purunga is summoned, Goku asks Nail to bring back every good person that died to the Saiyans, but Nail says that they can't bring back multiple people in one wish. He also informs Goku that Purunga is capable of granting three wishes, so Goku decides to bring back Piccolo, Chiaotzu, and Ten Shinhan. Yamcha can be revived with the Earth Dragon Balls if Piccolo is alive once again. Once all three wishes are made, the Dragon Balls get ready to scatter, but instead, they turn to stone right in their place. Elder Guru has passed on, and with no Frieza intervention accelerating his death, he can't come back ever again. With his friends revived and his mission complete, Goku flies back over to the battle, just in time to see Frieza enter his final form. The battle between the Saiyan Prince and the Emperor of the Universe was about to reach its climax. Frieza tells Vegeta to bask in his overwhelming power, but Vegeta just smirks. With a powerful scream, Vegeta transforms into a Super Saiyan. While training with Goku on the way to Namek, he used Goku's experience to understand the transformation for himself and triggered his own Super Saiyan transformation by doing so. Frieza is taken aback by Vegeta's form. There could be no mistaking it. The reason he destroyed planet Vegeta, the thing he feared would topple his empire, the Super Saiyan, was standing right in front of him, and he had to face him down. As their battle began, it became clear who had the overwhelming advantage. Vegeta, after getting his power unlocked by Elder Guru, was at a power level of 2 million. Basically, the power level his base form was at after being healed by Dende in the original version of events. This brings his Super Saiyan form to a power level of 100 million, which is enough to handle a Frieza that is only using half his power currently. Now, we could argue that Frieza's full power is 200 million, but that's a contentious topic due to it mostly coming from one statement, so we'll just go with the Daizenshu's power level of 120 million as Frieza's full power. Either way, the beating Frieza receives from Vegeta while his power is halved is comparable to the damage done by the Genki Dama in the original story, so I think the conclusion remains the same no matter what happens. As Frieza is being beaten by Vegeta, he mocks his former ruler, taunting him about how weak he has become. But Frieza simply says that if he was at full power, he'd easily take down Vegeta. The Saiyan Prince laughs and his arrogance shows as quickly as his smirk does. He tells Frieza to power up then so he can be fully dismantled by the Super Saiyan he feared so much with no regrets or excuses. Goku wasn't sure this was the right decision, but even he had to admit that he wanted to know Frieza's true power as well. So Frieza begins to power up, and a torrent of ki shakes the entire planet. Vegeta quickly realizes that Frieza is stronger than he is, and just as quickly as he realizes it, Frieza begins to beat down Vegeta with ease. Goku knows this is bad, so he turns to Nail and hands him the Senzu Beans and the capsule for their spaceship. If either of those were to be destroyed, they'd be in big trouble. After passing the items to Nail, Goku turns Super Saiyan and jumps into the fight to try and save Vegeta. Frieza had severely wounded Vegeta and threw him to the side when he saw another Super Saiyan. Goku was slightly stronger than Vegeta, a base power level of 2.5 million, which makes Goku's power level as a Super Saiyan equal to that of Frieza's. Goku quickly grabs Frieza and tells Nail to get Vegeta. He goes as quickly as he can and takes Vegeta away. As he does, Vegeta tells Nail to give him one of the beans. Meanwhile, Frieza breaks free from Goku's grasp and the two begin to fight. Completely evenly, it seems like there's no way to determine a winner from this battle. Vegeta eats his Senzu and is back to full strength, but now he has even greater power due to the Zenkai he receives from this. With little trouble, he jumps back into the fight and takes out Frieza. Planet Namek was saved, but Nail was the sole surviving Namekian outside of Piccolo. Goku tells Nail that he'll use the Earth Dragon Balls to bring the Namekians back to life, and Nail thanks them for their help. Goku takes back the capsule and the remaining Senzu, and the two Saiyans fly back to Earth, once again training the whole way back. However, 
a new threat awaited them in the near future. Tinkering away in his lab was a vengeful Dr. Jiro, except this time, he's aware of what Super Saiyans are. A vengeful Dr. Jiro was tinkering in the mountains, trying to make the perfect artificial life form, but this time, he's aware of the existence of the Super Saiyan, and he even has its DNA to analyze and use. Meanwhile, Goku and Vegeta are training with each other on the way back to Earth, and even more interestingly, a newly revived child is anxiously awaiting the return of his father, death having made him want to seek strength more than ever before. Before we get into that though, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button if you want more Dragon Ball content. Also, follow me on Twitter if you haven't yet. It's the best place to keep up with what's going on with the channel, me, and more. Twitter.com slash Carthus Dojo. After a month passes, Goku and Vegeta finally return to Earth. Their landing point was trackable due to the ship being made by Capsule Corp, so some of our cast make their way there to greet them on the landing. Notably, Gohan is the most excited to reunite with his father after months of being separated. An embrace is shared between father and son, but Goku could tell that Gohan was a lot different. In the afterlife, Gohan chose to stay with Piccolo, and that meant he would also train under King Kai, making Gohan even stronger than Goku was upon being revived in the Saiyan Saga. Something interesting to note here is that King Kai's training made Piccolo at least as strong as Nail, probably stronger, and if you use the guidebook statements, Nail only made Piccolo 10 times stronger, meaning his training with King Kai gave him a power level of at least 100,000. This may all seem crazy, but that's not even everything since Piccolo only arrived on King Kai's world a day after Goku started his journey to Namek. That means he was only training under the Kai for about five days before being revived. So King Kai's training provided a boost of over 28 times in five days. The point of explaining all of that is to apply it to Gohan. In the Saiyan Saga, Gohan had a max power level of 2800. Taking the 28 times boost into account, Gohan is now at a power level of 78,400. What's even more crazy is that actually isn't stronger than he was in the original story at this point. During the fight against Frieza, Gohan had peaked at a power level of 200,000 when not angry, a ridiculously high power level that was more than likely due to a combination of Zenkai's and having his power unlocked by Elder Guru. So while Gohan is stronger than Goku imagined he'd be, there's still plenty of room for him to improve even further, and the first thing to teach him is how to become a Super Saiyan. So, training begins for the next year and a half. Having Gohan die was a real eye-opener for Chi-Chi as well, so she's more supportive of his training since she'd obviously prefer he'd be alive. Notably, this isn't a character change for Gohan. He still wants to be a scholar, but he sees equal merit in strength, so he better splits his time rather than devoting himself entirely to training or studying. This begs the question though, why even train? Well, it's simple. Beyond just Gohan's own desire to be stronger, in this timeline, Goku returns to Earth sooner than the original story. So on the day of his return and reunion with everyone else, another person is present, future Trunks. With Goku back on Earth sooner, Trunks could give Goku the heart medicine and the warning about the androids earlier than originally. I'd also like to address something here before you comment about it, and you know who you are. Yardrat has nothing to do with the heart virus at all. Goku catches the heart virus two and a half years after Yardrat in the future timeline, or three years after Yardrat in the main timeline. The way Trunks describes the virus to Goku is an incurable disease in this time, but in the future, there's a medicine for it. This means this is an Earth disease that has medication to cure it generally available to the public in the future. This wasn't a cure made by Bulma, so please stop commenting that the virus came from Yardrat on every video. It didn't. Also, viruses don't come from poisonous atmospheres anyway. He'd just be poisoned, not diseased. Pretty simple there if you ask me. Let's get back to the story though. This additional year and a half of training is massive. During this additional year and a half, Gohan not only catches up to his canon power, but also surpasses it. 
Super Saiyan was still something outside his grasp, but that wasn't too important at the moment as there were still three years for him to unlock that power for himself. With no Frieza surviving Namek, King Cold had no way to find out Earth is where the people who killed his son are from, so for now, he's not an issue. This means the full four and a half years are spent training, but it leads to something more pertinent than just a raw power increase. Goku and Vegeta are now painfully aware that Super Saiyans aren't enough in the future to defeat the androids, and the transformation on its own wasn't even enough to defeat Frieza either, so they realize they have to find a power beyond Super Saiyan. Having Super Saiyan early allows the two to see beyond the Super Saiyan wall earlier as well, and so they train to surpass Super Saiyan before the androids even emerge. So despite Jiro being aware of Super Saiyans, the Super Saiyan grades eluded him. This means we have quite a few changes to go over, and one of them is the timing of the heart virus. Since Goku is back on Earth early, I wouldn't go as far as to say he gets the heart virus years in advance, just that he gets it the same time as he did in the future timeline. For those who aren't aware, that's a six month difference. Six months earlier in the future timeline, that is. This means Goku is cured and back in fighting condition when androids 19 and 20 are released. Of course, this leads to the two artificial humans being easily defeated by both Vegeta and Goku as they have mastered Super Saiyan in the four and a half years of training. Alongside them, Piccolo and Gohan were training as well. Since Gohan achieved the Super Saiyan transformation later, he was the last to gain mastery over the form, but his potential allowed him to catch up to Goku and Vegeta. Any more training would push the young half Saiyan ahead of the two full Saiyans as it did in the original Cell Saga. Piccolo doesn't have Nail within him, but he still makes strides towards a better life, and even with his own potential, he is able to become more powerful than Androids 19 and 20, just as he did originally. I really can't stress enough how an extra year and a half of training helps the Z Fighters here, so there's nothing to worry about for now. Trunks is confused that the androids look different, but he assumes that he must have altered the past when he originally came back to warn them all. With Vegeta, Goku, and Gohan at a power far beyond his own, Trunks asks if they can teach him how to master Super Saiyan, so he can save his own timeline which he knows won't be altered by these events. Goku says he'd be happy to, but Vegeta has realized that Trunks is his son after hearing his name, so Vegeta says he'll make sure he can protect the future on his own. Goku tells Vegeta to use the Room of Spirit and Time so Trunks doesn't have to stay away from the future for too long, and Goku tells Gohan that they'll use the room next, since there's something he wants to test too. Gohan is confused, but he agrees to go in with his father. A year with just the two of them was something that they may never get the opportunity to have again. Of course, this isn't the end of the threats to Earth. Even more specifically, it wasn't the end of the threat of the artificial humans. One more presence lurked in the shadows, concealing its exact location from even Kami, but never needing to reveal itself as it did in the original timeline since 17 and 18 were never awakened. That's right, Cell is heading straight for Jero's lab, and he will consume the sleeping androids as they have no means to resist. Almost a full two days after Vegeta and Trunks use the time chamber, Cell has finally arrived, his suppressed key making his travel much slower, and he begins to make his move. As Cell begins to absorb Android 17, the Z Fighters can sense the power increase. They aren't scared of the raw power that they're sensing though, they are scared of how that power feels like people they know. Luckily for them, Cell has no Frieza or King Cold DNA as the Imperial duo never made their way to Earth in this version of events, so his DNA is made up of Goku, Vegeta, Piccolo, and the humans instead. Because of this, we could argue Cell would be weaker, but considering the fact his DNA would have Super Saiyan Goku innately due to its earlier introduction, he may even be better off than before. Remember, Cell doesn't train, so having Frieza's potential doesn't really help him that much, as it's his birth strength that makes him so formidable. I think the argument of whether Cell is weaker or stronger in the story could go back and forth for ages, so instead, we'll just assume he's around the same as his original strength. Even with his original power, Perfect Cell wouldn't be enough. 
Remember, Trunks and Vegeta have exited the time chamber, and it would only be a matter of time before Goku and Gohan exit as well. It seems that having Goku turn Super Saiyan early accelerates things leading to the Cell Arc, thus trivializing it. Remember, Vegeta has already mastered Super Saiyan and got an extra year and a half worth of focused training before the arc began. That time should equate to, if not surpasses time wasted, making the Super Saiyan grade 2 form in the time chamber in the original story. Because of this, another year of training with Mastered Super Saiyan should put him above Perfect Cell, since he's only at best as strong as he was originally. So, without further ado, Vegeta and Trunks fly from the lookout to the location of the growing power source. When Vegeta arrives, Cell smiles wide and thanks Vegeta for saving him the trouble of finding him. Vegeta asks why he can feel the key of different people emanating from Cell, so Cell tells Vegeta that he was created from their DNA. The perfect fighter. The perfect artificial life form. The perfect being. Vegeta laughs and tells Cell that he doesn't have enough of his DNA to be considered perfect in any way. With Vegeta on the case, Cell is the one who is arrogant and is eventually defeated by the Prince of the Saiyans. Or so he thought. With the help of his improved Piccolo DNA, Cell could regenerate his whole body from one single cell. In combination with his Saiyan DNA, the artificial life form was granted a power boost as well, becoming the dreaded Super Perfect Cell. However, timing wasn't on Cell's side. As he went to finish off Vegeta, Goku and Gohan arrive on the battlefield, both in their Super Saiyan forms. Goku steps up and tells Cell that he'll have to fight him now, but that wouldn't be an issue. There was something deep inside Cell that made him crave a battle with the infamous Son Goku. Judging by Goku's power, Cell thinks he has this fight already won, but Goku has a surprise for Cell. He powers up even further and transforms into a form beyond the Super Saiyan. Goku has gone into the time chamber with Gohan to discover and master Super Saiyan 2. As it was for Vegeta before, the time chamber was on top of an additional year and a half of training before the arc even began, so an additional year and Super Saiyan 2 allows Goku to surpass Super Perfect Cell in every single way. With the same mindset he had in the original Cell arc, Goku defeats Cell with one all-encompassing blast, making sure not to miss even a single Cell when ending him. This of course leads us to a time of peace for seven years. With Goku still alive and Chi-Chi more accepting of training, Gohan and even the newly born Goten continue to gain strength over time. During the time skip, we can even say that Super Saiyan 2 is mastered, allowing for everyone to gain access to the form, including the kids. Obviously, we're missing fusion and instant transmission still, but those probably won't even be required against Boo. I hate to do this for the millionth time, but once again, I can't see a convincing or interesting Boo saga existing in this version of events. It would all be the same until the battle in Babidi's ship happens. Vegeta and Goku would still defeat Pui Pui and Yakon with ease, but the major difference is Gohan would be strong enough to beat Dabara easily as well, thus stopping the resurrection of Majin Buu. As a lot of you have seen in the recent content on this channel, I'm trying to craft interesting versions of the Buu saga, but this was one I really couldn't find an interesting way to tell that still falls within the bounds of the series logic. With all that said, Four years of peace was about to be upon our heroes until the inevitable arrival of the God of Destruction, Beerus. Unlike the original story, Goku is currently on Earth when Beerus begins his hunt for the Super Saiyan God. This is because Goku never received the money from Mr. Satan, so he was never allowed to stop working in order to train. Notably, Mr. Satan is still rich in the story as he is the World Martial Arts Champion, but he isn't the hero that defeated Cell, so his accolades are quite a bit smaller than the original story. This didn't stop Gohan and Videl from going to the same school though, and the two met and married as they originally did. With Goku on Earth, everyone is gathered for Bulma's birthday party, which leaves one main location for Beerus to visit in his hunt for the Super Saiyan God, the cruise ship. Without Elder Kai to warn King Kai, there's no one informed enough to inform Goku and Vegeta as to what's about to happen. So when Beerus and Whis board the ship without anyone noticing, and Vegeta is the first person they talk to, 
the Saiyan's mind returns to a time when he was a small child, unable to move or act as the pressure Beerus exudes is just far beyond anything he can handle. At this point, things remain relatively the same. Bulma sees Beerus and invites him to the party with them. Meanwhile, Vegeta is keeping on his toes to keep Beerus happy. The god had asked him about the Super Saiyan God, and he'd never heard of such a thing. If the only reason he came to Earth was the Super Saiyan God, then Earth might be destroyed if he doesn't get it. Vegeta removes the thought from his mind. The best thing he can do now is keep Beerus happy and keep Goku away from him. So the party goes on as planned, but all good things must come to an end, as Goku approaches Beerus while Vegeta is getting more food for the God of Destruction. By the time Vegeta sees them together, it's too late. Before getting into that though, only 20% of the people who watch these videos are subscribed, so make sure you hit that sub button so you never miss an upload. You can always unsub in the future if you change your mind. So you're the Saiyan that managed to turn Super Saiyan before all the others, huh? Goku chuckles and asks Beerus how he could know that. It truly is impressive to become a legendary warrior that even Frieza feared. Perhaps that means you could be a warrior of even greater power, the Super Saiyan God. Goku tells Beerus that he's never heard of the Super Saiyan God, but Whis interjects that Goku had never heard of the Super Saiyan before transforming either. Goku thinks and says that's true, but there's something about being a god that just seems beyond everything he's ever known. That's when he slams his fist into his hand and says that maybe, if they fought, it could help Goku understand what being a god is truly about. Beerus smirks at Goku's answer. Are you sure about this, Saiyan? I'm unlike any foe you've ever faced up to this point. Goku smiles and transforms into Super Saiyan. The two fly above and away from the ship to begin their battle. It isn't much of a fight though. Goku can't even land a hit on Beerus, and Beerus is getting bored. As Beerus yawns, Goku powers up to Super Saiyan 2. The form is completely mastered at this point, making it take no stamina for Goku to use or transform into, and even makes it a bit stronger than its original version. But even with this perfect iteration of the form, Goku can't land a single hit. Goku smirks and tells Beerus he's really something else, but he wonders if he can handle his secret. Goku pulls back and powers up even further, entering the Super Saiyan 3 form to Vegeta's shock. He asks Gohan and Goten if they knew about this, and they nod. Goku had been focusing on surpassing Super Saiyan 2 for the last four years. No, maybe even before that. Mastering Super Saiyan 2 was more so for evolving beyond that form rather than solidifying it as a cap of power. With this form, Goku has truly surpassed his canon counterpart at this point. He's faster, stronger, and he's actually landing hits on Beerus. Vegeta is amazed and thinks Goku might just be able to take him down, but when he looks over to Gohan and Goten, they both seem extremely worried. When Vegeta's eyes move back up, he can see that Goku is slowing down. His punches aren't as sharp, and his key is lowering. So, you've transformed into a state that grants massive power at the cost of stamina. Quite the opposite of being godly. But it was slightly impressive at least. Beerus then slams Goku into the water below. When Goku comes back out, he's in his base form again, and Beerus has returned to the ship. So tell me, Saiyan, did fighting a god give you any ideas? Goku shakes his head. The only thing he learned is that some gods are more terrifying than others. Kami was nothing compared to him, after all. That's when it hits him. Kami. Goku asks Bulma to bring out the Dragon Balls, and with Shenron's help, they learn about the Super Saiyan God ritual, leading to Goku becoming the first Super Saiyan God. The form wasn't what anyone expected. Slimmer, with the same hairstyle as base Goku. The only difference is the hair is a godly red and Goku's key is completely undetectable. This is what Beerus waited for. The Super Saiyan God has been born. Goku looks at his reflection in the water and sees it looks a lot like his normal state, but doesn't think anything of it and flies away with Beerus to continue their battle. The two battle it out and it seems like they're even to everyone watching, but Whis tells them to pay closer attention. That's when Piccolo notices Goku's running out of breath while Beerus isn't. What's wrong, Saiyan? Tired already? Is your borrowed power running out? Or are you just struggling to keep up? 
Goku's face turns into a snarl and he charges at Beerus, who gets behind Goku and tells him that he'll destroy the Earth if this doesn't become more fun quickly. Then, the god simply chops Goku on the back of the neck, sending him flying down towards the planet. Goku is plummeting at full speed, but his mind is focused on his next move. How can he come back from this? How can he counter Beerus' incredible power? Could he even hope to beat Beerus at this point? Is Super Saiyan God just not enough? That's when it hits him. Goku remembers his reflection. Super Saiyan God looks just like his normal form. Maybe this isn't his limit. Maybe this form is just the beginning. A new beginning. A new base form. If Beerus wasn't lying about destroying the planet, Goku would have to try with all his strength. So he begins to focus with everything he has. Everything he's learned from mastering Super Saiyan and Super Saiyan 2 is being poured into Super Saiyan God, allowing Goku to access Super Saiyan Blue. Having had Super Saiyan longer and focused on it for a longer time as well, Goku was able to combine the forms more naturally and showing Beerus a power he didn't expect. When Goku returns to the atmosphere, Beerus smirks. So this is the answer you've come to. If turning Super Saiyan worked for Frieza, then maybe you might have a shot at beating me as a godly Super Saiyan. The battle intensifies immediately. Goku's power is growing as he fights, and with the extra speed and strength, he isn't struggling to keep up with Beerus. This was truly a battle of gods, but it was not something that could go on forever. Despite closing the gap, Super Saiyan Blue just isn't a match for Beerus, and eventually, the god has had enough fun to satisfy him. It also seems like Goku's god power is finally fading away, so he decides it's about time they wrap up this battle. Goku reverts back to his normal Super Saiyan form, but doesn't notice it happened, so he keeps fighting. And at this point, Beerus doesn't have to put any effort into dodging Goku anymore. Or so he thinks. As the battle appears over, Goku manages to land a punch on Beerus, surprising the God of Destruction as he reveals to Goku that he's lost his God Key. They are back to how the battle began. Super Saiyan versus God. Goku doesn't understand it either, but Beerus posits a theory. He tells Goku that the godly power he garnered wasn't just the key gods use, but something more permanent. A flame that burns within Goku has merged with his very being, so that regardless of hair color, Goku is now and forever the Super Saiyan God. Goku doesn't understand what he means, but all he does know is this means they can continue their fight. So, the two begin again, and even more surprisingly, Goku is not only matching his Super Saiyan Blue power, he's surpassing it, pushing Beerus further than any mortal has ever pushed him before. In the end, it was never going to go Goku's way, but his battle with Beerus showed the god that though the Super Saiyan god was born this day, he would not become his greatest rival until a bit later in life. From here, the arc ends as it originally did, and leads us directly to Resurrection F. Honestly, this arc doesn't have much in terms of changes either, the main one being that Gohan is stronger than he was in the original. With this power, Piccolo doesn't have to die as Goku is able to protect him until Goku and Vegeta can eventually make their way back to Earth. And while Goku is close to beating Frieza, as it happened originally, he gets overconfident and is nearly killed. Vegeta takes over from here, but since Super Saiyan Blue was discovered earlier, he destroys Frieza before the revived Emperor can even think of destroying the planet. That's sadly where this story ends though, as this timeline starts to become more and more similar with the main timeline. Minor things are different for sure, but to go through them with any real scrutiny would either be boring or just repeating Dragon Ball Super. So I hope you enjoyed this series of what if Goku turned Super Saiyan early. Make sure you hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, and thank you so very much for watching.